Okay. So today we're going to begin to talk about the actual vasculature now that we have a decent idea, or at least have started to internalize these ideas about differences in pressure, differences in resistance, and how they're going to affect the amount of flow through the cardiovascular system. So most important, where we're going to spend most of our time is on the arterioles. Just a sort of heads up. So what we're starting off with is just some basic definitions, which hopefully most of you know already. Um, but we have our arteries carrying blood away from the heart. Veins return blood from the heart. And in between, we have um, microcirculation, so blood vessels that we can only see microscopically. So we need a microscope to see them. They go from our arterioles, which are carrying oxygenated blood, to our capillaries, where we're going to see our sites of exchange. Uh, so where we're actually getting oxygenated tissue to our uh, tissue, right? Oxygenation to our tissue and taking back our carbon dioxide. And we're going to pass into the venules before we go to the veins. So we'll notice if we look at pictures of these structures and look at this table that gives us some information. And we do have some variation here. So some of the things we're looking at are the internal diameter of these blood vessels. Now, uh, someone remind me why we might care about the diameter of a blood vessel? Exactly, so that diameter is gonna affect the resistance. So we'll notice that the diameter of arteries is quite high, they don't have very much resistance. Veins also do not have very much resistance, right? These are our major blood vessels trying to carry blood quickly throughout our body. Now our branching vessels, our microcirculation, much smaller. So we're going to see that they have higher resistance. This is going to mean that we have some slower blood flow here through individual uh, arterioles, capillaries, venules, especially in capillaries. Uh, we might think about how this maybe makes a little bit of sense because we want to make sure we have time to exchange our oxygen carbon dioxide. We'll also notice that the wall thickness is different. Now, the reason we're going to care about this is largely the differences between arteries and veins. So notice arteries here, thicker walls than our veins. This is partially because of muscle, so they are muscular, but arteries, their main difference from veins so we'll see some other differences, is that they're going to be highly elastic. So elasticity is coming from that connective tissue in beige. Okay, so highly elastic, this is what's gonna allow them to kind of hold pressure, hold this uh, potential uh, kind of energy in them. Our veins, by contrast, which we've hopefully seen in anatomy lab, I always tell you you'll see it, whether whether you guys really feel that you see it, I don't know. Um, but we remember the arteries are supposed to be kind of bouncy because of that elasticity, those thicker walls. Our veins are supposed to be floppy, thin walled. Um, we're going to come to refer to the veins as kind of a volume reservoir. Right? They're kind of flattened and collapsed, but we can add a lot more volume there without adding much pressure because they're so floppy, basically. So they're thin walled and highly distensible. Distensible is just referring to that fact that we can balloon them out really easily. So they're kind of like a foil birthday balloon, right? Those, those silver shiny ones, right? We can very easily put a lot of volume in there. So if we're looking at the wall of a blood vessel, we can look at layers not shocking, right? We've looked at different layers of different types of tissue before. So what we're looking at here in yellow is our endothelium, right? So these are our endothelial cells. We're gonna see these in all of our vasculature, so all of our types of blood vessels. Okay. Other components are gonna be a little variable. So we'll notice here at the bottom, 
We have our little bitty capillary, so our blood vessel that's a site of exchange. So you'll notice the capillary is just a layer of endothelium and a basement membrane. So this basement membrane is just kind of holding them together, right? So that's it for a capillary. So very thin. This is good because this is where we're exchanging different molecules of different nutrients, right? So we actually want it to be thin, want it to be small so that we can allow that exchange to happen. So other larger blood vessels will have more components. So like this artery, we see muscle. So in its case, last time we talked about muscle, we're mainly focused on skeletal muscle first and then cardiac muscle. So now we're talking about our third type of muscle, smooth muscle. So just a quick kind of, I don't know if this counts as a reminder or something new. So I guess I'm just gonna say it. So the way our smooth muscle is arranged, we wanna think of it as kind of a circle, kind of a full loop all the way around. So when we're thinking about this smooth muscle surrounding blood vessels, that muscle contracts as a circle contracts, that diameter going to get bigger or smaller? Yeah, so when we contract, right, when we pull that loop tighter, we're going to be getting a smaller blood vessel. If we dilate it, if we relax it, it's going to get larger in diameter. So this is the main way we'll be controlling resistance, which is why we care about it. So we want to pay careful attention to where we see smooth muscle, where we don't. Specifically, right, the capillary, we're not seeing any smooth muscle. So we wouldn't be expecting at the capillaries to be changing the resistance all that much, right? Our next layer out, our external layer, it's our connective tissue. So we have both fibrous and elastic parts. So the fibrous parts kind of form like a skeleton-ish, so that's the collagen. The elastic part, the part that makes it stretchy, that allows us to hold pressure in it, is the elastin. So this is particularly important in our arteries. That's where we're mainly uh, most interested in this connective tissue and especially the elastic connective tissue. So when we're thinking about our arteries, anatomically, we know that they have this large diameter you just helpfully shared with me, right? A large diameter means they're not going to have very much resistance. Large diameter, low resistance, which means we're going to have rapid transport. We're going to have a high rate of flow through the artery because of that low resistance, because of that large rate. So the walls are containing elastic and fibrous tissue, right? So that connective tissue. It's under high pressure because of all of that blood flowing through the artery. So all of that blood is also pushing forward, but it's also pushing outward on the wall. And that elastic and fibrous tissue holds the shape of the arteries, holds, holds them in place, right? If we had high pressures and they just ballooned out, our blood wouldn't be able to move forward. So they're allowed to balloon out a little bit. So they're a little bit elastic, but they're also fibrous, so they can't completely balloon out so that we keep pressure moving forward as well. There are muscular arteries. Um, so in a muscular artery, these are gonna be uh, smaller. They have less elastin and they will have some of the same features that we're gonna talk about in arterioles, basically. Uh, so we're gonna have smooth muscle that regulates the radius in these muscular arteries. Main place we think about the smooth muscle regulating the radius for the rest of this lecture, the arterial. So artery, some of these smaller arteries have kind of intermediate characteristics, basically. We've seen this picture before. Um, what artery were we talking about last time we saw this picture? Does anybody remember? Yeah, exactly, the aorta. So when we're thinking about the arteries, especially when we're thinking about the aorta, we're thinking of it as a pressure reservoir. So remember, right, 
as the heart beats, right, so as it contracts, we have ejection of the blood into the aorta. That's all well and good, right? We have pressure moving forward. We understand that pressure moving the blood out of the heart is going to send blood out to the rest of the body. But the heart is not always in systole. The heart is not always contracting. Right? It relaxes. We also have our longer diastole. We still need blood going to, right? We need it going through your liver. We need it going through your muscles. We need it going all over the place, even when your heart is in that relaxed phase of the cardiac cycle. So this is why uh, the pressure reservoir characteristic of the artery is important. So when we have that pressure coming through into our aorta, right, we have the expansion of the walls outward. You can think about it like blowing up a water balloon, right? So we're holding pressures in those walls. Uh, if we weren't all, all wearing masks, I would have brought in some balloons for us to look at, but sorry, I'll just have to imagine this here, right? So we're blowing up a water balloon. Kind of hard to blow in. That's the pressure fighting against us. But now we have air in the balloon. We let it go. What happens to the air? Yeah, it all comes back out, right? The pressure from the walls is pushing in on the air, and we have that, right? So the air is going to come out. So that's releasing the pressure. So that's what's happening during diastole, right? When we have this elastic recoil of the aorta, of this artery, to move flow forward. So that's what's keeping the pressure going. We know we need to maintain a pressure gradient in order to maintain flow. So we also have this word compliance here. So we mentioned compliance last semester, but I just want to mention it again here. So big picture takeaway that I find the most helpful thing for you to remember is that when we talk about something as being really elastic and being able to hold pressure and save it for later, right, we're talking about it as being elastic. This is kind of a trade-off with compliance. What compliance means is that we can fill it up with a lot of volume, but it's not creating much of a pressure change. So that's like the difference between like a water balloon and a foil birthday balloon, right? When you put air or water into a water balloon, right, it's hard, it takes a lot of pressure. So if you were to blow up one of those like foil balloons, say that's like, I don't know, like attached to a bouquet in a hospital or something, right? It's really easy. There's not a lot of pressure building up as you're trying to fill it. So that would be something that's highly compliant. So our artery, so these elastic properties, we're going to think of as a pressure reservoir. And when we ultimately get to veins, we're going to see that veins are highly compliant. So they're like the opposite. And they're going to be a volume reservoir. Right? So they're going to have a lot of volume. They're going to have a lot of space for blood. But it's not going to create much of a pressure difference or a pressure buildup when we put blood into the vein. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So the technical um, kind of calculation for, for compliance has to do with how well, I gotta get this right because the way they phrase it in your book is always a little confusing. But it's basically how much the pressure inside something changes as you put more volume in. Um, so something with low compliance has a really quick rise in pressure as we put more volume. Okay. So does this situation with arteries, specifically the aorta, make sense to people? Is this roughly familiar? Cool. Good. I hope that would be true. So compliance, technical term, is a measure of how the pressure in a vessel changes with a change in volume. So low compliance, we're specifically thinking arteries. What we're saying is if we put even a little more blood into that artery, it's going to end up very pressurized, right? It's going to be holding pressures in those elastic walls. That's what low compliance means. High compliance, like in our veins, means you can put a bunch of blood in there, 
doesn't doesn't really do much at all to the pressure. So you have to put a lot of volume in to create a comparable change in pressure from an artery. So we're thinking about this now with respect to arteries and veins. But next unit, we will also be thinking a little bit about compliance as relates to the lung. So I want to get kind of a gut sense of what compliance is here. Our low compliance is our water balloon, our high compliance is that foil balloon. With that note to self vent. So when we're thinking about that pressure in the aorta, varies with the cardiac cycle, right? So it varies whether you're ejecting blood, right? Our ventricular ejection, so our systole versus diastole, our relaxation, when we're not putting blood into the aorta. When we measure blood pressure, we measure both systolic pressure and diastolic pressure, right? That's why you have two numbers for blood pressure. You wanna know both what the maximum pressure is and what the minimum pressure is basically. So that maximum pressure is going to be when the blood is actively being ejected into the aorta. So that's when we're going to have the biggest swelling in the aorta. So that most volume creating pressure in those elastic walls. Our minimum pressure is during diastole. It's not going to be zero because we have that elastic recoil of the wall of the aorta, making sure blood is still going through. And so we are gonna have some pressure, which is good. Good, because it means we're still getting blood to the rest of our organs. Um, we're gonna compare these two numbers. So when we measure blood pressure, we do this with a blood pressure cuff and something called a sigmomanometer which is basically just measuring uh, that pressure. We start out the pressure cuff by compressing the artery, right? So when you measure your blood pressure, first they inflate the cuff, right? Get it nice and tight. So what we're doing here, that tightness, that constriction is actually cutting off your brachial artery. So we don't have blood flow through it, right? Good, we're not doing this at the aorta. Would be difficult to do with the aorta, but also very convenient for us uh, that, that we can still have blood flow through our system while we cut off blood flow in our arm. So then we slowly let air out of the cuff, which means we're lessening the pressure on the arm, lessening the pressure on that artery, and eventually the blood flow is going to return. Right? So at a certain pressure, that blood vessel is able to fight against the pressure, it's able to open. And this creates a sound. Just like when we talked about the heart, what the sound technically is, is that turbulent jostly flow, right? It's not nice and smooth. It doesn't have a really good round opening. Um, so it's this turbulence that's creating the sound, called the Karatkov sound, right? when we're measuring our uh, blood pressure. So the first time we're going to hear the sound is when our blood pressure cuff reaches the systolic blood pressure. Now, when our blood pressure cuff is at the systolic blood pressure, what do you think is going to be happening to that brachial artery during diastole? That brachial artery always open all the time once we hit that systolic pressure. Oh, it's not. No, it's not. So what's happening as we're measuring this pressure, we're going to start to hear this sound over and over again, right? But that's as we hit systolic blood pressure over and over again. And in between, we're going to go back to having that artery compress, right? And we're going to go back to having blood flow cut off. All right, so we're just measuring that systolic blood pressure kind of spiking, opening the artery for a bit, and then collapses back down. So what we listen to to figure out the diastolic blood pressure, that minimum of pressure, is for where the sound stops. So we're going to keep releasing pressure from the cuff. And at a certain point, that blood is able to flow smoothly. It doesn't get cut off at all anymore. It's just most 
smoothly flowing through the artery the way it wants to, the way it normally does. And at that point, we don't have this turbulent flow. So we're gonna stop hearing the sound. And that's how we know we've reached that minimum of pressure. Now, as you continue to let more and more air out of the top, right, there's still not going to be a sound. So our pressure for diastolic blood pressure is where it first disappears, right? Because of course, if the blood pressure cuff is even below that, still doesn't matter because it's still not cut off. So that's what this image uh, from your textbook is showing you. So we're starting off, let's see the way we did. Okay, so we're starting off with this blood pressure in our cuff, sorry, this pressure in our cuff from that air that's cutting off our circulation. We have our little sigmomanometer that tells us that the pressure in the cuff is 130 as we start. So we're letting air out, letting air out, letting air out. And then we're going to reach this point where the pressure in the artery is the same as the pressure in the cuff. All right, so before this point, we have no blood flow because the artery is cut off. But when we hit this point, we start hearing that sound as a little bit of blood starts to get through during these peaks of pressure. And we start to get some flow through here. So we're gonna hear a sound here. Then we hear silence as the artery is cut off again. Then we'd hear a sound as it opens up, silence again, sound. And then we'd finally have total silence when our green line here, our pressure is always above the pressure in the cuff. So that would be our diastolic pressure. So our two points that we would measure on a graph would be like the first point, our green line intersects with the pressure in the cuff. And then the last point, that our green line intersects with the pressure in the cuff. So when we lift the blood pressure, our bigger number is on top, that's our systolic pressure. Um, so we just give both numbers, systolic pressure over diastolic pressure. So in the previous image, we had a blood pressure of 110 over 70. This is not the only pressure we are ever interested in. Um, not looking for AMP? <laughs> You're welcome to join us. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, we also have pulse pressure. So pulse pressure is the difference between these two numbers. So the pulse pressure in this situation would be 110 minus 70, giving us a 40 millimeter of mercury pulse pressure. What we're actually more interested in, right, is our MAP, our mean arterial pressure. And we have to do a little bit of calculation for this. So why do you think this is not just an average? Does anybody remember why we don't just average these two numbers? Yeah, exactly. So we want to know this over a period of time, the systole and diastole are not even in the length of time they occupy. The diastole is longer, so we're creating a weighted average here. So diastole is twice as long. So we add up our systolic pressure, twice our diastolic pressure, and then divide by three. So actually, there should be another parentheses here. We're just creating this weighted average. So we have 110 plus 2 by 70, so plus 140 divided by 3, hopefully 83.3. So when we talk about someone's blood pressure, when we just measure a blood pressure, we're going to give a number like this, systolic over diastolic. But as we're talking about the physiology, we may want to pay attention to matching it. Uh, mean arterial pressure. 
I remember that that's the one that we use in our equation for flow through the body. Right? We, uh, we're subtracting our CVT, our central venous blood pressure from max, but central venous pressure is about zero. So that was our pressure gradient, our pressure difference for that flow equation, which we then divide by our resistance, which we saw what we're actually going to be measuring in a person is our total peripheral resistance to get our bulk flow through the cardiovascular system. I don't have this set up as a clicker question or a poll right now, so I'm just gonna let you read it and answer it for yourself on a piece of paper in about a minute or so, and then check and hope we all agree. Actually, let's check them off one by one. So we're looking for something that is not a feature of our arteries. So let's just check off which of these are true. So does an artery have elasticity and low compliance? Yep, yes. All right, so we're trying to hold pressure in that pressure reservoir, that's the elasticity. The low compliance means that when we put blood into it, it creates that pressure that we're holding in the pressure reservoir. What about thicker walls? Do our arteries have thicker walls? Yep, they do, All right? So thicker walls, they have some smooth muscle in there. They have um, lots of connective tissue adding into that elasticity and low compliance. What about valves? No, not really, right? Okay, so valves, they have Two valves in arteries that we talk about related to the heart, those semilunar valves, but they're not to deal with the high blood pressure in arteries. They had to do with the function of the heart itself. You don't see valves like anywhere else out in the arteries. So arteries are pretty much devoid of valves. They don't have them, except for those two related to the heart. This is different than veins. So we're going to see that veins do have valves in them. We'll talk about how that helps with their function when we get there. So this is one of our differences between uh, arteries and veins. And just like we have smooth muscle in those thick walls, we also have a bunch of fibrous tissue in those thick walls. Okay. So let's take a second and see if we can hear some blood pressures. Oh. All right, I'm gonna have to go this with the link. I'm determined for us to get this. Maybe if I downloaded the PowerPoint, it'll show up. get these to work, we may have to do this next time, but I'm hoping. No, don't protect me. Okay. Is that a link? Ah, maybe that's the link. Great. Okay. I remember we're trying to think of our systolic pressure and our diastolic pressure. We're thinking about um, what is happening in the arteries as we hit each of those. 
Like they were inflating the cup. Now that we know what's going to happen, let's let's do that one again. So you'll notice you can also see that uh, needles start to pulse. We're not worried about those sounds as we go up. Are we listening to a different one? Let's move on to the next one. Okay. Um, but you notice how you started to hear a loud ticking sound that then eventually stopped. Uh, so hopefully you lined up right. I'll do some more practicing if they didn't. So hopefully for that first one we saw, we got something like 92 or 62. I know that there were some why it sounds at, at the beginning there, but you'll notice that we heard a, like a, a really consistent loud sound as we drop lower that down. So that's that's why we picked 90 to it there. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's that's our top number. And then when we stop hearing the sound, it's the lower number. Now in practice. Usually they have machines that do this digitally for us, right? But it's, it's fun to do it with a stethoscope. I recommend trying. So that brings us to our arterial. So our arterial, our parts of that microcirculation branching off of our arteries that are going to be controlling the resistance of our system as a whole. So these are going to be the largest factors in determining our total peripheral resistance, our TPR. I remember we had that uh, cardiac output is basically gonna be MAP, our mean arterial pressure over our total peripheral resistance, right? And this is coming from our flow equals a difference in pressure over resistance equation. We've just subbed in, right, when we think flow, we're thinking about blood flow from the heart. When we think about pressure, we're thinking about pressure in the aorta. When we think about resistance, thinking about all the resistance out in your system. In this case, it's mainly coming from those arterioles. So the arterioles are going to connect the arteries to our capillaries and a little bit to uh, another structure that we haven't talked about yet called a meta arterial. We're going to see that we have some ways to kind of shunt blood and skip over capillaries, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The reason our arterioles can control resistance is that they have those rings of smooth muscle that allow them to regulate the radius. So we have smooth muscle elsewhere, but the main place that we care about it is in the arterioles. So more than 60% of that total peripheral resistance is coming from the arterioles. What we may also notice is that those arterioles are experiencing the largest pressure drop across the vasculature. Not a good color. So we had high pressures in the arteries. And our arterioles start out with high pressure. But as we drop down to the opposite end, they're gonna branch and branch and branch into many capillaries, and they're gonna end with relatively low pressure. So this is the biggest drop. You can see that there is also a drop across our capillaries. You can see once we're into the venules and the veins, the pressure difference is becoming really low here. 
way we're controlling resistance is by controlling the radius of that arterial. Radius is just half the diameter. So if I say diameter, is it true that if the diameter decreases, the radius also decreases? Radius is what we had in that equation, but sometimes we do refer to either way. So how big that arterial is, how wide it is, how big that lumen is, the lumen being that empty space that's filled with blood inside the blood vessel. So that's going to depend on how contracted or not contracted the smooth muscle is. A smooth muscle has this feature of tone, which we mentioned very briefly when we talked about the different types of muscles way back when. Um, but this is just a thing that is true about smooth muscle. So it has a little bit of contraction. It's always in a little bit of a contracted state at rest. This means that we're going to be able to both decrease and increase from that sort of baseline state, right? We're not at the minimum or the maximum when we're at rest. We're somewhere a little bit in between. So there's, there's movement in both directions possible. So that initial contraction level is independent of our extrinsic influences. What we can change with vasoconstriction, contract more decrease the diameter, therefore decrease the radius, end up with a small, skinny arterial, hard to push blood flow closer because there's a lot of resistance there. Alternatively, we can dilate that arterial. So we're relaxing the smooth muscle. When it's sort of circular muscle relaxes, right? It creates a larger opening inside. So we increase the radius decreases the resistance because we have this inverse relationship between radius and resistance. So if radius goes up, resistance goes down, radius goes down, resistance goes up. So the reason we're going to want to do this is to control the amount of blood flow to different capillary beds. So we're trying to control for example, which organs are getting more or less blood. So when we say capillary beds, we might mean capillary beds within an organ. We may also want to do this to overall regulate mean arterial pressure. So that would be like a more general effect, right? If blood pressure is too high or too low, altering the radius of all of your arterials throughout the body can be a way to adjust. And we're going to take a look in a while at some reflexes that allow this to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that correct? Is that correct? Uh, wait. Um, ah, okay. Um, so we're, we kind of haven't gotten either of these. So extrinsic influences are going to be like hormones, basically. So we're going to see um, your autonomic nervous system has an effect on the constriction of these blood vessels. Um, the intrinsic effects, yeah, are going to be the metabolic activity. So the carbon dioxide and oxygen levels that we see surrounding. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Perfect segue. <laughs> uh, so intrinsic control of the distribution of blood to our different organs is going to be based on which organs need blood right now, right? So when we are digesting food, we're going to want more blood flow to our gut, to our intestines. If we're running away from something, we're going to want more blood flow to our skeletal muscle. We're going to alter where the blood is going depending on the body. The way we do that is by varying the resistance in the vasculature going to those organs. So just like we could calculate for the whole system, the cardiac output was the mean arterial pressure divided by the total peripheral resistance. 
We could also calculate blood flow to one organ in particular. And the way we would do that, blood flow to an organ. Our pressure difference is still just going to be that mean arterial pressure. Um, so the kind of blood pressure on either end of the organ. But now we'd be thinking not the total resistance in the entire body and the entire system. We'd be thinking about the resistance within that organ itself. So you can see an example of kind of how this would work. So here we have our heart. We know that in our systemic circuit, we have organs getting blood uh, in parallel, right? So we're not going through organ A, then organ B, then organ C. They're all getting blood at the same time, right? So that's why mean arterial pressure is going to be a good measure of the pressure differential across an organ. Right, because if we had to go through A, B, then C, it would get more complicated. But since we just have these sort of independent loops, we can still just say, okay, veins are at this pressure, arteries are at this pressure. The difference is the difference between those. Okay, so in this situation, all three of our organs are getting equivalent blood pressure, sorry, equivalent blood flow because we have uh, these arterioles of equivalent radius and therefore equivalent resistance going across to the veins. This example, we can see that we have slightly different radii through tubes A, B, and C. So we have slightly different amounts of flow. Right? So our pressure difference is still our pressure difference. Okay. But we've changed the resistance between these three. So A, which has the largest radius, has the greatest flow. So we could measure it in liters per minute, so like it's absolute measurement, or we could measure it as a percentage of cardiac output. So this would tell us like relative to the other organs versus just like the amount of blood that that organ is getting. So we can see that B with our second highest radius, then getting the second most blood, is getting the least blood. So I want you to note because this is what's going to be, this is going to be different versus the next slide, is that our total flow here is three liters per minute. So in this image, what have we changed? You can tell me what we've changed. Yeah, exactly. So we can see that in B, we have this constriction, we have this narrowing in the center. Okay. So what effect is that going to have on resistance when we have that narrowing? It's gonna increase the resistance, right? So if we decrease diameter, increase resistance, which means what's going to happen to the flow here? Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So the flow decreased. Flow decreased because our resistance went up. All right, so our change in pressure stayed the same. Our resistance went up, which means our flow went down. This is an inverse relationship here. So we can see that B is now getting less overall blood, so less total flow, less bulk flow, fewer liters per minute. Okay. But we might also note that the total flow has changed. Right, before we had three liters per minute, now we have 2.5. Why do you think that is? Yeah, so as it decreased there, as it increased the resistance in B, it increased the resistance of the system as a whole as well. So that's why our flow is decreasing. Um, when we first mentioned PPR last week, total peripheral resistance, right? So it's like we add up the resistance in A, B, and C. 
that's why our system as a whole here, our total cardiac output is a bit less. So we see B is what went down, A and C. Their absolute numbers stay the same, but in terms of proportion, before we had, I forget exactly where we were at 50% or something like that. I've forgotten the numbers. Yeah, before A was at 50%, total amount of flow across A hasn't changed, but it now has a greater proportion of the blood flow as well. So when we're thinking about the intrinsic control of our blood flow, we're thinking about really local factors. So like right next to these blood vessels that are changing their radius. So this is gonna depend on the contractile state of the smooth muscle. We're gonna see that really this is due to metabolic activity in the surrounding tissue. So when we increase metabolic activity, kind of like we go on a run or uh, intestines or moving food along, any type of metabolic activity in the tissue, that tissue requires oxygen, because it requires ATP to do its best. So when we increase metabolic activity in a tissue or in the body, generally, this is gonna cause vasodilation because we want more blood to fuel that metabolic activity. When we're using tissue, it needs oxygen. We wanna get it more oxygen to make it easier for blood to get there. That said, this means our triggers for, in, for increased vasodilation may or may not, depending on how you're thinking about it, feel a little contradictory. But when we increase metabolic activity, right, we want more oxygen in that tissue. But that means that the state we would measure before we get the oxygen there is that we have a buildup of carbon dioxide. Right, so carbon dioxide is that gas we're giving off as we pull apart our glucose. Right, so this is our waste product from metabolism. So the way we would tell that that tissue is metabolically active is by excess waste product. Right? What we want is oxygen, but what we have is too much carbon dioxide. There are other things we could measure, potassium and hydrogen ions. But really the big one that we're, that we're going to focus on is that carbon dioxide. The opposite can also be true. If you decrease metabolic activity, that tissue doesn't need that much blood anymore, we're going to send the blood somewhere else, right? Some other organ would rather have that oxygen. Um, so if we have a buildup of oxygen, so excess oxygen, it's just kind of hanging around next to the tissue not getting used we're going to decrease blood flow to that tissue. The way we do that is constricting that vasculature, so bringing less blood to that tissue in the first place so that it can evenly uh, kind of consume oxygen and produce carbon dioxide. So I'm gonna say one thing on this slide and then we'll uh, break for today. So our baseline that we're gonna start at tomorrow is with a steady state. So when everything has the amount of blood that it wants, we're gonna have O2 delivered as fast as it gets consumed and carbon dioxide, when it gets produced, it's going to get pulled away. So we're gonna have this even uptake of oxygen and removal of carbon dioxide as fast as the tissue is using for producing it. So at this point in the steady state, we don't need to do anything to a blood vessel. So if we have buildup of something that we're gonna change. So I hope your week is great, everybody. We're gonna stop here. Stop share. Uh, I don't have to stop sharing, but it'll stop our recording.